Good to see you this morning. I can't think of a better day for Christmas today to fall on than on Sundays. Amen. Just to be together in God's house on his day, just worshiping him and rejoicing over the celebration of this season of our Savior's coming to save us and change us. Amen. You know, I just want to take a, a little bit of time this morning and just talk about what, kind of what you saw in the video there, what Christmas is and what Christmas means to me and what Christmas should mean to every one of us. I know I've watched in interest of the media stories over the last week, you know, where they do all these little human interest uh, packages on the media. They tell about acts of kindness and goodness and meeting people's needs and feeding the people in the streets. I'll story about that yet. And, but if, after every one of these little, and they're great stories, I mean, I'm not putting that down, but it seems that after every one of those stories about some act of kindness or love or generosity, someone says, that's what Christmas means. Well, yes and no. What Christmas ultimately means, I think the Gospel of John clearly states it in a verse that's familiar probably to most of you. If you know it, you can quote it with me. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have that's what Christmas means. That's the heart of all that we talk about. Amen. God so loved the world. I penciled out a few things this morning on the overhead for you that, uh, that, that simplify the message of what it, what it means and, uh, and what it should mean, I think, when we start studying scriptures and see what the Word of God has to say and compare those things with what we think Christmas means. Sometimes it's pretty far apart. You know, to some people... Christmas is about putting up decorations and lights. And, you know, it's, it's the one you drive down the neighborhood and you can barely see because the lights are so bright. But to some, and, and that's Christmas to them. To, to some people, it's, it's gifting. You know, they, they love to give gifts. And they spend the money. They love the shopping. They love doing all those things. You know, me and Amazon are best friends. <laughs> you don't have to get out of the comfort of your chair. You don't have to go looking for a parking place. You don't have to get in the flesh fussing and cussing at everybody in the parking lot. Move faster, move slower, whatever it might be. You know, but that's Christmas to some folks. To some folks, it's, you know, a party. And they're going to go out and get drunk. They're going to carouse. They're going to have a high old time, so to say. But that's not Christmas. To some people, Christmas is about, you know, it, it's traveling. To some people, it's entertaining, having the family getting together and all those things that we attach to Christmas. I mean, but let, let's just take a moment since this is Christmas morning to talk about what Christmas really means and what it really is. And I think, as we said a while ago, that John 3, 16 passage states it so clearly. For God so loved the world that he gave, there's your first Christmas gift, his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him wouldn't perish, but would have everlasting life. So to me, Christmas is first of all a time for, for remembering that tremendous passage of Scripture and, and, and realizing that that baby born in a manger those 2,000 plus years ago, that dynamic event that changed all history as we know it and changed the world, literally, incredibly changed the world. Even we have our time based upon that, a, you know, B.C. and A.D., uh, that, that his impact was so incredible. It is a time of remembering the greatest gift ever given to man, a time for remembering the greatest love ever demonstrated by anyone for man. For God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. It's a time for remembering his life. It's a time for remembering his teachings. It's a time for remembering his miracles. It's a time for remembering the prophecies. It's a time for remembering not only his birth, but his death and his resurrection. We should take time to pause and remember that. I remember uh, talking to pastors in recent years when they get together, it's questions about what are you doing for your Christmas service or what are you doing? Can you have anything new and novel for the Christmas service? No. <laughs> The original's pretty good. You can't improve on the story here, amen? You can't improve on the fact that God sent his son, clothed him in humanity, and that his son gave his life for us, the ultimate sacrifice for all our sins. We should stick to the original story. We should remember that manger scene. We should remember the shepherds. We should remember the wise men. We should remember Mary and Joseph traveling to pay taxes, amen? We should remember those great events surrounding the Christmas story. The humility of people like Joseph and Mary and the shepherds and the wise men who came. Elizabeth and, and Anna and Simeon and Zacharias. All those great characters that surround the story. We, shouldn't, we should replay those. I think too often we think the rest of the world knows the story. And they don't. 
The Christmas story's been lost in, this, 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 uh, in capitalism and humanism of the world that we live in today. We should remind people it's really all about Jesus Christ. It's a time of remembering, but it's also a time of loving. The Christmas story demonstrates the great, incredible love of the Father. The Christmas story is all about the Father loving us and caring about us and, and reaching out to us. It should be about an understanding that, hey, I was separated from God. I was separated from God by my sin. I was separated from God by my, my mortality. I, I was dead in my trespasses and sin. I had no real spiritual life nor hope of spiritual life. But God loved me enough to reach out to me and forgive me of my sins and take time to draw me to himself. In all the preaching we do, in all the gathering we do, in all that we do even as a church or as families, let's always remember that the motivation for this particular season is the love of God, that God loves you. God, can, no, You may feel like nobody in the world loves you, but if God loves you, it doesn't matter because his love is so much more vast than human love and human acceptance and human approval. Remember, be careful to remember that God cares about us in the same time as we talk about the season, and we should love as he loves. It's not only a time of loving, it's a time of giving. For God so loved the world that he, he gave. All that we can express and say about love always comes back to an action. And love without an action is not really love, is it? But love, the kind of love that God has, we call it in the Greek language, that agape love, that is the kind of love that gives. God, in his love, looks on humanity. And he can't look on us with indifference because love compels him and love motivates him and love moves him because God is love. He sees us in our desperate situation. He sees people who are hurting. He sees the lonely. He sees the sick. He sees the, the lost souls of the world. And his love demands of himself, he demands of himself, that he gives and he shows this compassion and this great sympathy and this great empathy by giving this gift freely and graciously to every person and understand this love is so incredible that we are not deserving persons, although it's sometimes we might think that we are, we are not. We are born in sin. We have a nature that's fallen. We're separated from God by our sin. We've lied, we've stole, we've cheated, we've gossiped, we've talked about others behind their back, we've said things that weren't true, we've took things that weren't ours, took glory for ourselves that didn't belong to us, lifted ourselves above, I mean the list is endless of all that we've done. We've made gods out of our own self, we choose to obey ourselves rather than to hear what God says. But yet in the midst of all that, God loved you so much that he reached out in his grace to give his son Jesus Christ the full and perfect and complete sacrifice for our sins God's grace is a time of giving it also should also reflect in our lives that we are givers as well fourth thing Christmas means to me it's a time of forgiving God forgave us Jesus Christ paid on the cross the ultimate price for sin if you're familiar with the Bible at all, you know this little verse that says, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of, sin is, the wages of Joe Arm's sin is death. The wages of your sin is death. I mean, that's the price that has to be paid for our sin. But what does God do? God sends this great gift in his son, the perfect sacrifice for our sin. He who knew no sin, and at the cross and on the cross, he becomes our sin, takes our place. And if we come to him and receive this gift of love, we receive forgiveness. Forgiveness. Now, all too often, we don't possess that same forgiving spirit that we see demonstrated in the life of the Father. Sometimes our forgiveness is absent, and instead we are cynical and we have a spirit of judgment. We look down on others. But maybe it's a good day for you to remember you need to forgive. It's always a good time when you're around family to remember that. Amen. Family, can, we can disappoint each other. We can hurt each other. We can, we, we can upset each other. We can say the wrong thing. We can do the wrong thing. Nobody knows us better than family. Therefore, nobody can hurt us more than family. Right? We just have that propensity for that. And in our sin nature, it just amplifies it. Maybe we should adopt and embrace the spirit of Jesus that is a, forgi a spirit of forgiveness. Maybe there's somebody here today that needs to forgive somebody. And that person may be here, they may not be here, they may not even be alive, but you still need to forgive them. You need to let it go 
Release it. Christmas should be a time of forgiving. But Christmas is not only a time of forgiving. I love this. It's a time of rescuing. The Bible tells us that God rescued us. He literally saved us. That's the content of that word. It's a taking us out of a, of a hopeless situation. There's no hope in, in eternity without God. There's no hope in facing uh, eternity without God. There's no hope of dealing with death without God. The Bible says that Jesus Christ came to take away the fear of death that held captive people all their lives. Fear of death captivates people and holds them in bondage. But when Jesus comes and his forgiveness is received, it's a rescue. It's a salvation. It's a deliverance. His name means that, even the name of Jesus means that he is our salvation. Jehovah is our salvation. So in salvation, we have deliverance. We have a rescue from sin. We have a rescue from eternity that would cause us to be separated from God. Now we are inheriting something different. We inherit eternal life. Listen, we are all descendants of a dying race. But in Christ Jesus, he delivers us, he sets us free, he rescues us. Or else we would all perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. What a great message. That's the original gift, amen. That's the greatest gift. It's the gift that keeps on giving. And we ought to keep on giving it. We should be the people who constantly remind the world that there is good news to be heard, good news to be spoken, good news that will literally change your life and rescue. This leads me to that, that sixth point is this. Christmas is a time of changing. And a lot of people change at Christmas for a little short time. Everybody seems to get you know, benevolent and kind and sweet to one another. And, you know, they, they, they leave a little extra tip money on the table. They, they're a little nicer to the person at the grocery store. They, you know, they, they survive the Walmart crisis and feel real good about themselves and tell somebody in the parking lot Merry Christmas and may even drop something to the red kettle, you know. But, hey, what Jesus does in our life is he, he didn't change us on a temporary basis. When he comes... And we believe on him, the perishing, except the grace of God. He fits us, basically. He changes us and prepares us for eternity. This new life. We, the Bible says if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Not he will be, although there's going to be some radical changes that take place in eternity. We're going to realize all that we have been given. But right now, we are still changed. We get what we need to be what we're supposed to be. We don't, we, we don't have any excuse to sit back and say, well, you know, I'm really trying hard, but, you know, I, I just can't change. No, God changes us. He makes us new creatures. All things become new, the scriptures, and all things are of God. We have new aspirations. We have new goals. We have new ideas. We have new hope. We have a new direction. We have new life. It's a time and for changing. And even as Christians with new life, there's still changes that God's taking me through. There's still a work he's doing in my life. And I should be reminded that that changing process is never old, over. It's never done until Jesus comes and makes us completely new with these glorified bodies. And I still believe in even that state there's going to be a lot to do, a lot to grow. Although we'll have glorified body, we'll have the sin nature still maturing to say on some level it's going to happen in our life. New knowledge, new understanding, new, new comprehension of the glory of God and the spiritual things is from glory to glory to glory. But right now, maybe there's some changes that need to be made in your life. And maybe, I don't know, but for whatever excuse, you've made up all these reasons why you can't change. You know? I have a real theological terminology for that mindset. It's this. <laughs> it's not true. The power of God is present. Jesus is ready. God's ready to do something in your life. God's ready to make a difference. Let it begin today. Amen. Let God do a work in your heart and life. Let the change carry on. Don't be stuck where you are. Keep moving forward. Keep glorifying God. The last thing I want to just remind you about Christmas is, if I do believe all this and I do accept all this, I will be a person who rejoices. I don't understand Christians that are, have no joy and have no rejoicing spirit, especially it's Christmas. If something ought to come out in Christmas, it ought to be an attitude of rejoicing. We're rejoicing in God's precious gift, his unspeakable gift, as the Apostle Paul said. We ought to be rejoicing in the, the release that we have from our sins and the forgiveness that God has given us in our life. We rejoice in the new life, the new goal, a new mission, a new purpose. There's plenty to rejoice about. 
You look at the Christmas story. It's filled with rejoicing. Angels showing up from heaven. Choirs of angels singing glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth, goodwill with men with whom he is pleased. I mean, it's a message of hope. It's a message of rejoicing. The shepherds watching the angels sing. They're rejoicing. The wise men are rejoicing. Mary's rejoicing. Joseph rejoicing. Simeon, when he sees Jesus, he's rejoicing. Hey, we have plenty to rejoice about. Obviously, this ought to be a time where we can rejoice. The spirit of pessimism, do not let it settle in on you. Do not let the spirit of cynicism settle in on you. Reject those things. Say, I believe the message of Christmas is a message of Jesus, and it's a message of life, and it's a message of changed life, and it's a message of hope for tomorrow and hope for today. I'm going to rejoice and praise the Lord. In a nutshell, that's what I believe Christmas is. And that's what I believe Christmas means. I'd ask you today, in the reflection of that, what does the coming of Jesus Christ into this world mean to you? What does it mean to you? Maybe you haven't even received him as Lord. Maybe you haven't accepted this free gift of salvation that came wrapped up in the life of Jesus Christ. Maybe you have, but yet you've forgotten about it and you've walked away from your relationship and your fellowship with Jesus Christ. Maybe some obstacle has been in your way in recent days, months, or even years, and you have, you have not dealt with it. You, you've not overcome. You've, you've not marched forward. You, you're kind of stuck right there. Christmas should remind us of the changing of our own hearts and lives that God is always working out in us because of the presence of Jesus Christ in our life. I'd ask you to stand with your heads bowed just for a moment. Maybe you're here today and on this...